Hello everyone, this is Councilmember Mitch O'Farrell, and this is my first virtual council member in your corner. To start things off, I'd like to introduce my friend and your public servant, our Public Works Commissioner, Jessica Colosa. Thank you so much, Councilmember O'Farrell, and thank you for hosting today's council member in your corner. Um, I know that I look forward to these when you host them, and I'm so excited that even in the midst of a pandemic, you know, your team doubled down. You know, you did not shy away for taking your show on the road and taking this virtual. Um, and so it's really exciting that today's theme um, is historic Filipino town, but really the information that you're providing today and the resources that you'll share with the city um, is really for everybody. Um, and I love that about your series because you make government accessible. Um, from our public work side, you know, we're continuing to, um, you know, be full speed ahead in terms of all of our services from trash collection to cleaning up our streets, making sure that you all get the services that you need. And you'll hear uh, a little bit more about it uh, later. And uh, before I turn it over to the council member, I did just want to uh, highlight his incredible leadership at the city. Uh, he is a champion for the community and somebody that really fights for people who aren't at the table. Um, he's done so much during COVID-19 specifically to make sure that renters are protected, that your voice is there, and that you all get the resources that you need. So I hope you all know how lucky you are to have a, a really great person championing uh, 13th District. So with that, I would like to turn it back over to our amazing council member, Ofero, who is going to uh, kick off his first virtual council member in your corner series. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Um, this is a mutual admiration party because uh, since you've been commissioner, you've done so much. Uh, and my office loves collaborating with you and your colleagues on the Public Works Board to make good things happen in the public rights of way. And I'm gonna get to some of the incredible things that we're working on together in a moment. Uh, let me just explain for everyone uh, what council member in your corner is. Um, my first term in office began in July of 2013. And after being part of that first campaign for about a little over a year of just constant campaigning uh, to successfully uh, win the seat, um, I knew that for me it was really important just as a constituent that the city, that, that, that I know as a constituent that the city is there, that services are available to me that perhaps... Um, everyone isn't aware of to the degree that they should be. So I set out to do a monthly walk across the 13th district for as long as I'm in office. I spent the better part of a year knocking on doors asking for something. And that was, will you support me as your council member? I was so privileged and so blessed to be serving as the newly elected council member that I set a determination to give back in some way the whole time I'm in office. And so through two terms, I've now done 58 of those community walks, not counting the resource fairs that we've done and other outreach events. But on a Saturday, once a month, we go to a community. And the very first one was in historic Filipino town. So I wanted to do my very first virtual one seven years later, almost to the day in historic Filipino town. What do we do? So we knock on doors, we have a whole team, we gather together, um, I have city departments join, joining. I have constituents who are volunteering. They can be from organizations or not organizations, anyone who wants to, to join. I have my clean team that we do uh, several hundred small and large projects a year through the Conservation Corps, and we pay out of my discretionary funding because it's a priority for me. And we do nearly 900 of those uh, cleanups throughout the week, throughout the year. And so, there's always a cleanup component to it. There's an outreach, uh, and we give the information door to door on how people can access city services that are available to them. And as I mentioned before, not everyone knows that. Also, the deputy, my representative uh, on my behalf from the office, also walks with me, and we introduce myself and the deputy uh, at the door to the constituent. And we've done this, as I mentioned, for years, so it's a way of, of giving something back 
and making sure that people in our neighborhoods feel connected to their city government. I have a fundamental uh, belief that the local elected official, city council member, uh, is usually the first and most important contact that people who need assistance are going to reach out to. I wanna make sure that no one feels alone in any neighborhood. So we wanna make sure government, local government is accessible to you. So that's the whole purpose of council member in your corner. We also celebrate a community member or a small business every time. And we gather everyone who's attending um, and we present a city certificate of either good volunteerism, outstanding uh, volunteerism, or a local serving business. So we, we try to make stakeholders feel good about what they do in these communities as well. Um, and it's a real sort of bar and raising experience, if you will. I've always thought that public service had a spiritual component to it. And that is we're all a large family and we care for one another. We disagree with one another like family members do. But at the end of the day, we kind of pull the rope in the same direction and to lift, uplift each other. And I'm, I, I just fundamentally believe in that. And you inspire the best in people. We involve young people, we involve children, schools, you name it. And it's been a real wonderful experience. Now to that end, what I'd like to do is for this virtual uh, council member in your corner, I'd like to acknowledge someone that we lost very suddenly last month, and that is John Swing. Uh, John had been uh, newly uh, installed executive director of C to, uh, uh, SEPA, uh, and we're going to hear from SEPA in just a moment, seek to involve Filipino Americans. And uh, sadly and tragically, we lost John to COVID-19. And when I found out, I know I'm not alone in, in the shock that we felt. And so I think the community is um, still reeling from uh, our John's loss. So I just want to take a moment to acknowledge him again here in this, in this forum. Uh, and just as a reminder that everyone has something special to offer any community. Um, in John's short term as executive director, he gave so much and played a significant role in the Filipino town uh, a monument gateway that we're gonna talk about in a little bit as well. So I just wanna acknowledge John and, and the community's great loss um, and all that he did and stood for in his life. Um, so I wanted to, to mention that. Um, so I'm gonna mention some things now that we've done uh, working with SEPA and other organizations uh, in the community over the last seven years now. And I mentioned the Hi-Fi Gateway, Historic Filipino Town Gateway. Uh, Jessica um, and Fiji and the, uh, so many uh, have been part of this success as well. So my office was able by working with the community and with our city departments, we identified nearly half a million dollars of funding uh, to fund this landmark for historic Filipino town that will welcome everyone heading east on Beverly uh, as they enter into historic Filipino town over the historic First Street Bridge. Um, the Eastern Gateway pays tribute to both the legacy and the bright future of the Filipino American community in Los Angeles. We unveiled renderings in recognition of Philippine Independence Day earlier this year the gateway is slated for completion by the end of 2020. I'm really big on pedestrian safety. In fact, pedestrian safety has always been and will continue to be my number one transit priority as council member. Safety around our schools, safety around our senior centers, around our recreation facilities, um, around busy commercial areas. So we completed the Temple Street pedestrian safety project which includes uh, street reconstruction, protected left turn lanes, signal timing upgrades, new crosswalks, replacement of curbs for ADA compliance, Americans with Disability Act, repair to other damaged curbs and gutters, gutters. It also included the installation of speed tables. Now, I'm such a city geek, I'm a nerd, because I really get into when the city can make these improvements that a lot of people may not have a name for, but I do, because it's the little things that can improve the quality of life in a neighborhood. So, for the first time ever, the Department of Transportation 
upon my insistence and that of my team, and I have to highlight the good work of Juan Fregoso, Marisol Rodriguez on my team, we really pushed hard to install speed tables in a major thoroughfare, a major boulevard, an artery. They only would put them in secondary or feeder streets previously, but we installed two of them on Temple, uh, the first major boulevard in all of Los Angeles that has speed tables now, and we posted them near schools. So what are speed tables? Um, They're about 20 feet long. They're elevated and elongated speed humps, essentially. And if you don't slow your car down to around 20 miles an hour, you're gonna get a flat tire or you're gonna damage your axle. Because we're serious about slowing down traffic around our schools. We know that we have an issue in Los Angeles with hit and run. So we installed those speed tables and the statistics have been extremely promising uh, in terms of collisions since those were installed. Um, Also, four tables were installed near the schools uh, and the senior center also within historic Filipino town. Um, Department of Transportation was also able to approve a full signal at Occidental and Temple. Now that's approved. It'll be undergoing the design and Montesol is looking for the money right now. And you know what Montesol always does? She always finds money. So we're going to install that signalized um, crosswalk, the full city of Occidental and Temple. The community has been wanting it forever, and we know how to deliver that. And we'll look for it in the budgetary process if need be, uh, but we will explore all options. I now want to talk about Blue LA Expansion. Blue LA is a rideshare company, and they're known for putting in these all-electric vehicle, maybe you've seen them, the, the cars, rideshare in communities um, for low-income users. Uh, it's $1 a month membership and 15 cents per mile if you qualify uh, with your income level. And it makes it really, really affordable for everyone, especially in this COVID-19 situation. Um, to be able to afford to not have to own a car, but yet be able to use one at a very, very low rate. We first rolled them out a couple of years ago at LACC. They've been very successful. And you can also contribute to helping the environment because it's all electric. There's tiny little cars and you can safely access your needs in the neighborhood uh, in a very inexpensive way. It's a five-year pilot project. We'll bring electric vehicle uh, car sharing, as I mentioned, Um, And in fact, we have uh, one installed at the PWC, uh, the People's Workers Center over in historic Filipino town. They're uh, off of Glendale, not far from Temple. Um, We're very proud of the hi-fi lights. Uh, We worked uh, with uh, Ms. Caloza's predecessor and members in the community, including including Jocelyn. I know Jocelyn Gaiga Rosenthal is on the call, so she helped with this. Um, The... um, Let's see, the Hi-Fi Lights partnered with Board of Public Works to improve half, to approve and provide half of the $625,000 project. We installed 54 new bus stop lights in Hi-Fi and we held uh, a juried um, sort of situation because the, uh, we also installed artistic um, elements to the lights at all of these shelters, and they're quite beautiful. And they're uh, uh, designed by a young uh, a Filipino-American who actually lives in Glassell Park. He's the one who was awarded the design, and they're beautiful. You check it out if you get a chance. They're installed between Temple um, and Hoover. I'm sorry, on Temple between Hoover and Glendale. Uh, so that's another one. Um, I think lastly, I'm going to talk about the, the uh, Beverly Boulevard transportation enhancements. So that's what we're working on now. The pedestrian improvements along Beverly Boulevard between Vermont and Beaudry. Heart, the heart of historic Filipino town along Temple and Beverly are the two major east-west corridors. Improvements there um, created a more walkable and pedestrian friendly experience to help contribute to the overall goal of promoting, promoting the use of the public transit system. Um, They include 17 new compliant curb ramps, five reconstructed compliant driveways, 
three new curb extensions, two median refuge islands, uh, one located at Lafayette Park uh, Street, surfaced with cobblestone, so it's an attractive um, uh, element, and one at Occidental Street with enhanced landscaping and irrigation. So what is a refuge island? A refuge island is something that we install on the ground that gives a, a sort of a way station for pedestrians who are caught between the signal turning green and red. So it's a safe haven. Also, it's a visual cue for motorists to slow down. Study after study shows that when motorists are given visual cues, like landscaping or street furniture or uh, lane narrowing, that they slow down. So anything we can do to slow down the traffic to make it safer for pedestrians, uh, we do that. Um, also includes um, 19 new street trees, four new bike racks, continental crosswalks. Those are the big uh, ladder, the big wide ladder type crosswalks that you see. Now, for that, we identified $1.37 million in funding. I will say this, that the bulk of my priorities in terms of expenditures have been to make neighborhoods safer in the public right-of-way. Between that and building bridges at the Los Angeles River so we can get more people to that natural environment away from vehicles is something that is a real priority uh, of mine. Um, I want to remind everyone that at the end of this, we're going to take some questions. So uh, I know that we have them kind of rolling in. Uh, but what I'd like to do now, I mentioned Fiji earlier, uh, Fiji Victoriano from Search to Involve Filipino Americans has joined us um, and has been doing amazing work and we love working with you all. Uh, we have a long history with SIPA and SIPA is the kind of organization that you can't imagine a neighborhood not having it. Uh, that's how important SIPA has been to historic Filipino town. So without further ado, Fiji, please take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Mitchell Farrell, for having us in your first virtual session of a Council Member in your corner. Uh, it is such an honor and privilege for us to be included. And, and thank you also for thinking about John Swing and honoring him earlier. So thank you for that. Um, hi, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm Fiji Victoriano. I'm the Director of Operations for Search to Involve Filipino Americans, also known as SIPA. Uh, SIPA is a 501c3 nonprofit organization, and uh, we were founded in 1972. So about 48 years now, uh, we have been serving historic Filipino town and other neighborhoods throughout Los Angeles County. Uh, SIPA enriches and empowers generations of Filipino Americans and others by providing really three main pillars. Uh, one is health and human services. Uh, the other is community economic development. And the one that we just added recently in, in the past two years is arts and culture. Um, and also, of course, this is a place where people of all backgrounds can come together to strengthen community. Um, due to the pandemic, you know, we have suspended public events and in-person community service that were originally conducted at our office. Um, our headquarters in historic Filipino town is currently closed and undergoing a redevelopment. Uh, we are all very excited about this project of re-envisioning our community space in historic Filipino town. Uh, there will be an official announcement about that redevelopment project uh, in the next few weeks. So uh, everyone just watch out for that. Um, it'll be a great thing, great news you know, for the community. Um, since we have all started working from home, in March, uh, several of our services have been continued online and or by phone. Um, some of the main services include the small business program. This is one of our staple programs at SIPA. Uh, we help entrepreneurs and small business owners overcome barriers to growth and success, You know, especially now where small businesses have been heavily impacted by the pandemic. Uh, we actually produced a small business survival and success uh, webinar uh, last April. Um, I believe some of the content are still relevant today. So you can watch the recordings of that, of those webinars on our website. Uh, watch out also for more online workshops coming your way in the future. Uh, we will definitely be, you know, be uh, proactive in helping our small business community. 
Uh, we have also distributed uh, care packages in historic Filipino town and nearby neighborhoods uh, with the help of uh, community partners who have generously donated to us. So this include like non-perishable items, uh, toilet papers, you know, hand soaps, hand sanitizers and masks uh, during the pandemic. Uh, we are always open to accepting these uh, types of donations to be distributed to our community. So please do reach out to us. Um, another program that we do at SIPA is our youth and after, schools, uh, after school programs. Uh, these are basically out of school events that enrich youth uh, to be better leaders for their community. Uh, the after school program was conducted in our affordable housing El Centro Loreto, Loreto apartments, um, but we will be trying to create an online uh, version of this program in the next few months. So hopefully, you know, all of historic Filipino town and neighbor, neighboring um, communities can join us in that. Um, last May, we also produced a webcast series called Filipino Fridays um, in celebration of the Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. And a lot, a lot of our guests today were in that. Uh, and so thank you for supporting that uh, program as well. Uh, you can watch recordings of that on our Facebook page. So everything Filipino, you know, culture, food, music, everything like that uh, was featured there. Um, we do have an upcoming online Filipino summer program for kids, uh, ages seven to 12. So we usually had this summer camp in our office, um, but right now we're doing it online. It's gonna happen on August 3rd to the 14th. It's gonna be every Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays from 10 o'clock in the morning to 1 p.m. Um, you know, you can get all the information that you would uh, need from our website and our Facebook page as well. So do join us uh, if you have kids from age seven to 12. Um, we also have our CEPAS mental health outreach program. Um, this includes, you know, psychosocial assessments, um, community linkages, um, mental health first aid trainings and educational presentations in mental health. This program really aims to increase self-awareness uh, address cultural differences and destigmatize mental health uh, for the safety and well being of youth, children, and families. Um, I think this is very important in, in our community. And so last May, we also produced a webcast series called Wellness Wednesdays um, in honor of the Mental Health Awareness Month. So you can watch those recordings as well on Facebook page. Uh, we will be coming up with mental health first aid trainings in August and September. Uh, so hopefully you guys can uh, join us. This is all free. This will teach participants how to identify, understand, and respond to signs of mental health and substance use disorders. Mm -hmm. So watch out for um, you know more information on that, again, on our contact information, which I'll be giving out at the end of this. Um, our seniors program, uh, which were held before on Fridays, has moved online as well. So we do line dancing, Tai Chi classes, and karaoke. I think a lot of our senior community love the karaoke part. Um, they do it now every Tuesdays and Friday afternoons. Afternoons. This is in partnership with a Mother Movement led by Perla Santos, who is a community leader in Hi-Fi. Um, we have also compiled, you know, a resource list for community members impacted by COVID-19. Uh, this list includes resources for youth and families, small business assistance, mental health, seniors, and more. Uh, this list can be found on our website as well. One event that I did want to discuss with, with the community that we're having this week is a, a, our four-day digital creative conversations starting tomorrow um, until Sunday. It starts at 4 p.m., some of the most influential community members in the creative industry will be joining these panels. So if you're a creative person or you're interested in this industry, please do join us. Uh, just go to our Facebook page and learn more on how to register. Um, so lastly, I would say like the best way to learn more about our programs and upcoming events at SIPA is through our website. That's www.sipacares.org. That's S-I-P-A. C A R E S dot O R G. And our Facebook and Instagram accounts are also very active, and our handle is at SIPA Cares. Um, you can also call us anytime from um, at our number 213 382 1819. 
And you can also email us at hello at sepacares.org. Um, I believe that is it for me. I'm looking forward to more collaborations with the Office of the Council Member uh, Mitch O'Farrell and the community leaders in historic Filipino town, of course, in the future um, to better help and assist the community in Hi-Fi. So thank you everyone for all of your support for SIPA, especially in, in, in the last few weeks and maraming maraming salamat. That was uh, wonderful. Thank you, Fiji. And um, thanks for uh, 48 years, right? 48 years of uh, incredible work. Again, I can't imagine historic Filipino town without SIPA. That's how important you are, and everyone knows it. They don't need to hear it from me. Um, and also, uh, this redevelopment of your site uh, is something that we're eagerly awaiting news of as well, because we, we know uh, what your mission is, and it's a good mission. And so we, we all look forward to hearing that and how we can help you with that. Uh, because it, 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 it really is going to be a physical manifestation of your mission. So thank you very much. All right, the next person I'm gonna introduce is someone um, that uh, is responsible for housing in Los Angeles. Um, Ann Sewell is the general manager of Housing Community Investment Department and um, is new on that job, on that front, but not new with this line of work. She has quite uh, a, a winning track record of success on um, both in her, the nonprofit world and with the city uh, in areas uh, of helping uplift communities. And housing is one of the most fundamentals. Uh, and of course, in the era of COVID-19, we know how important protections are. Um, and so Anne, I'd like to introduce Anne, and she's gonna talk a little bit about some of the COVID-19 uh, protections uh, that we have um, created for renters. And then, of course, we'll elaborate on all of that as, as necessary. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Ann Sewell. Thank you, council member. And thank you for inviting me to this first virtual um, council member in your corner. It's one of the more fun things I've done in my 13 days um, as general manager, got to hear about online line dancing, which I wanna check out. Um, so that sounded really interesting. So um, the Housing Community Investment Department of the city does many things, but one of the things that we're gonna focus on today because it is of interest to so many Angelinas and particularly um, 25 years ago when I was working briefly with the city, we often said that 10% of the city's rental housing stock was in Hollywood. Um, and we've seen a lot of development all over the city, but it is still true that this council district has um, the, one of the biggest concentrations of rental housing stock, you know, just historically and, and even ongoing in, in the 13th district. So um, of interest to many of you are is the questions of what is the city doing to protect you as renters um, during this time of the pandemic. So um, first thing to think about is that you know, um, the city, uh, we, we have learned in the last week, last week, all week, we um, uh, had the emergency rental assistance program was being offered. Um, applications were open from Monday until the end of the, uh, the really until midnight on Friday. And we received over 220,000 applications um, and a good portion, 10% of them were from the 13th district. Um, one of the things we learned from that is that many Angelinos in the broader sense do not know the difference between the city of LA and the county of LA. And, mm -hmm. you know, we're so confusing with so many neighborhood names. So um, if you're ever curious about that, go to um, uh, zemus.lacity.org and try to look up your address. And if it does not come up, you are in a different community of LA County. So um, we're just advising people to, because the different rent ordinances and the different moratorium protections um, it matters which city you're in. But since this is the councilman's um, district and most of you are, um, are probably interested in it, you are all in the city of LA and you are covered by a rent stabilization ordinance that um, affects properties that were built and occupied before 1978, um, properties of two or more units. And um, we have about 640,000 rent stabilized units in the city that are covered by that. Um, and it stabilizes rents and it also lays out the 
terms under which a landlord can ask a tenant to leave. Um, so um, in the COVID time, in the, during the stay at home order, you know, on March 14th, we had, a, on March 4th, I apologize, we had a declaration of local emergency. Um, on March 15th, the mayor issued an emergency order. And then we had a series of moratoriums and um, freezes on rents and ordinances that provide protections to tenants. Um, on March 23rd, the mayor issued a moratorium on evictions for non-payment of rents for tenants who were unable to pay rent because of circumstances related to the pandemic. Um, and on the 30th, there was an additional freeze on rent increases in units subject to the rent stabilization ordinance. And then we've had um, uh, further ordinances and actions that extended the term of which that, that um, those freezes and that moratorium applies. So at this point, we have a rent freeze that is effective for rent stable, stabilized units that is in effect for 12 months after the expiration of the emergency declaration. Now we're not totally sure when that will be, but for 12 months thereafter, um, there's a rent freeze and landlords may not charge interest or a late fee on unpaid rent if tenants cannot pay it because of the, um, the pandemic during that time. Um, a tenant cannot be evicted during that time for non-payment of rent because of circumstances related to COVID-19. Um, and they can't be evicted for circumstances like the owner wants to move in um, family members or the property is being withdrawn from the rental market, what we call the Ellis Act, or for things that normally are not allowed like moving in additional occupants or pets if you don't have that agreement with your landlord, if it's related to COVID-19. So if you have to move a family member in related to the pandemic. Um, Tenants have up to 12 months from the expiration of the local emergency to repay the rent, and the landlords will not charge, may not charge interest or a late fee on that rent. Tenants are not required to provide documentation to support the, um, to their landlord to demonstrate why they can't pay their rent, although communication is always strongly encouraged. You know, these are protections, but it's always a good idea for people to talk to their landlords and, and you know, make sure everybody understands what's going on. And tenants are not required to sign a repayment agreement. Um, if you go on, on our website, you will, there's, um, which is um, hcidla.org, uh, there are renter protection fact sheets and things, um, lists connections to legal services organizations that can help you if you need um, support and, and to understand this or support dealing with your your landlord. Um, and with that, I am going to um, pause and, and we can answer any questions later on. Thank you so much, council member, for having me. Thank you, Anne. And just to uh, uh, add one, one little um, element is that if a renter has a landlord that decides to just ignore this emergency ordinance and these regulations that the city has passed, and they are law in the city of Los Angeles, and demands full rent or uh, has some sort of um, um, vindictive action against a tenant or doesn't accept even partial rent, then we've entitled the renter legally to a right of personal action. So the, the, the landlord, and we think it's a small universe because most landlords and tenants talk and they have an understanding. And HCID has done a great job at getting the word out on what these rules and regulations are. Uh, but I'm here to say that if you are a tenant and you do get demands from a landlord who may not understand or might be unscrupulous, give us a call at my office or check in with HCID because we can help you through, we can help educate the landlord on what the law is. Um, We've actually received very few complaints in the 13th district in my office. That's a good sign. But when we have, we've gotten them relief right away. So I just wanted to put that out there as well. For the most part, it's working, uh, working pretty well. And we will come back. Probably some of the questions will be related to this. And also um, the rent um, subsidy relief that we're offering, $100 million across the city, and then $1 million specific to the 13th district on top of that. We know that the $1 million that I allocated from reprioritizing away from other projects 
is going to help about 500 um, households in the 13th district, separate from the $100 million, which my constituents will also have um, a stake in that equally amongst um, the, you know, those who qualify. Um, just want to take a quick pause. Part of the council member in your corner every time we do one is we also do a project. And so we'll either do some sort of mural renovation or we'll, we'll stencil in something really uh, beautiful at a recreation center or we'll clean up a playground or we do some event. And so uh, for this one, we were in hi-fi all day. Sylvan de la Cruz is my community organizer. And so we sent out the, my clean team and this is what they did in Hi-Fi today. They've been out there all day. And so what we do is we clear the right of way so people can travel without obstruction. Um, we also will plant things. We'll remove graffiti. We'll uh, do some light tree trimming. We do that, as I mentioned, it's a, it was always a priority of mine. And so we began funding my clean team in that first month, and we do nearly 900 large and small projects like the one you just saw a year in the 13th district on top of what the city does naturally, whether it's sanitation or Bureau Street Service. Uh, so I wanna hand it to my clean team of Conservation Corps young men and women that are, many of them go on to city jobs and we've gone to several ceremonies celebrating, you know, the advancement of careers from these uh, youth who participate with Conservation Corps. So. I want to hand it to my clean team and to Sylvan for running the crew. Um, now with that, um, so what we focused on, what that is, it's west side of Glendale from Rockwood Street to Beverly, removal of weeds and debris that obstructed the right of way for pedestrians. And we're not done. Project will continue in the upcoming days with weed abatement along Beverly Boulevard, west of Glendale, and the public stairway at West Court Street and Glendale Boulevard. And I've, participated in cleaning up those stairs many, many times um, over the years. Uh, and it's an important access point for the residents who live above and below that huge hill. So uh, with that, I think we're going to take some questions. How much time do we have? Uh, about 10, minutes. 10 minutes. Okay, so we have some time for questions. And um, we have Tony Arenaga and Dan Halden on my team who are going to help with the questions. So Councilman, the first question is, what are you doing to address homelessness at Echo Park Lake? Okay, so the question was homelessness at Echo Park Lake, as you heard. Uh, my team has been working on this for months and months. So what we've done is we've allocated funds. We have the restrooms at the north end of the lake open 24-7. They are secure. They're cleaned daily. Um, we've also installed storage lockers for people experiencing homelessness in the area one block north of the lake. We also have mobile shower hygiene units that come three times a week, two times a week just north of the lake, and then another time of the week at the Edendale Library, which is another homeless service day that I sponsor out of my office. We've also been identifying um, long-term and short-term locations so that everyone who's experiencing homelessness at the lake can be housed either temporarily into permanent homes um, or right into permanent housing. Just today, I walked the lake this morning with Los, the Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority. I go out there from time to time. I'm very hands-on in my district. I'm, I, I'm in the district all the time. So I walked the lake, we talked to some people. You know what we found? We found a homeless family, a man and a woman and their young baby through our work with LASA we got them a voucher and they're gonna be sleeping under a roof in a nice, safe, secure hotel tonight. And so we've opened a case and we're, we are determined to find them permanent housing. Um, two Angelinos with a baby and they're on their way to being housed. So um, that's the short term and long term. We know that homelessness in Los Angeles didn't start overnight. We know that it is not getting better, um, but we know that COVID-19 is not helping which kind of brings us back to what Anne presented, and that is all of these efforts that we're working on collaboratively to keep people housed during the pandemic and keep them on a financial footing well after it ends. We certainly don't need to add to the homelessness 
uh, problems, which is why Council President Martinez and uh, collaborating with Herb Wesson and myself, we created that $100 million fund um, for a subsidy uh, for renters across the city. And there will be more information about that coming soon because we want to keep that going. It's very, very important. As Ann mentioned, we had nearly 220,000 applicants. We'll be able to help about 50,000 households, roughly, maybe a, a little few more, um, but we want to do much more. That's why we're working with our state legislature and our uh, U.S. Con congressional delegation for state funding and federal funding to continue the relief that people need to keep them housed and fed. Thank you. Next question. A constituent is interested uh, in applying uh, to a project underway near Vermont and Beverly. The constituent is a low-income senior. Could mm -hmm. you talk about that project and applying for that kind of housing? Okay, that's, that's a great question. So the project that the questioner is, is asking is probably the Metropath Villas, which is the very first HHH project that was green-lighted through the HHH program that voters approved back in 2016. Um, so that's 187 units, and we have about 20 uh, households moving in a day. So that's open now. So I, what I would urge the, the caller to do is contact my office, 213-207-3015. Um, or log on to my website, uh, cd13.com, so we can put you in touch with the um, PATH partners uh, and the, the folks who are running uh, and managing that facility. Council member, at Temple and Robinson, a sidewalk uh, is blocked with construction debris. What can be done about that? Okay, so the question was, Temple and Robinson, a sidewalk obstructed with construction debris. Email us or call us again and give us the exact address. We will, we will address that. And that goes for any area where you see an obstruction. Uh, call our office, the number I gave you, um, so we can get involved and mitigate that situation. In fact, it, we can do that through the city, of course. Building and safety can go out and we can mitigate. But if you see like a, an area that has overgrown weeds or a trash pile that someone just dumped in the dead of night, call us and my clean team can help with that as well. Council member, when will city pools be open? Oh, city pools. This, this one kills me. Um, we've opened a number of swimming pools since I've been in office. I'm a huge believer in recreation and swimming pools in the, in the dead of summer. But with COVID, um, we have issues with people gathering and children gathering in close proximity and splashing around. So we're having issues. I think the pools are going to remain closed until we get through um, COVID-19, quite frankly. But you better believe I'm going to be lobbying for them to reopen as soon as it's safe to do so. Last question. Can you talk uh, again, just to clarify, regarding the protections and assistance that are currently available for renters who are affected by COVID-19? Sure. I think that, uh, as Ann uh, conveyed, we've made it as simple as possible. You can go to HSID or you can contact our office. There's a one sheet, one piece of paper that you just fill out some information and you invoke that you are affected by COVID-19 and you have the protections automatically. Um, so we have uh, the, on, on RSO, rent stabilization units, uh, you cannot raise the rent during uh, the, the pandemic, during the emergency order. And everyone who's affected by COVID has 12 months for repayment of rent. You can apply for the rent subsidy program, either the citywide, uh, well, you apply for the citywide, and we're gonna be able to help an additional 500 households in the 13th district. Nuri Martinez and myself have allocated $1 million each to our districts because we pulled funding from something else. You know, I talk about public works projects a lot. So we, we uh, reallocated, we re reprioritized. 
So that's another one. And then lastly, let's watch what the state does because the Judicial Council, the Judicial Council of California Supreme Court Justice uh, has also opined and, and given a judgment that they can't start, uh, you can't legally begin eviction proceedings until three months after the state order has been lifted. So you've got a lot of protections in place right now. And again, uh, contact, contact our office or HCID and we can give you even more factual information about it. But work with me in terms of the state and the feds. I've authored several resolutions supporting the HEROES Act funding from the feds or uh, the monies that the state legislature is also working so to give more help to renters in the city. And I think we're, that was the last question. I think we're running out of time. Uh, let me just thank Channel 35. Thank you, Channel 35, for doing this. Um, we're going to do more of these virtual meetings as long as COVID-19 is out there. We're not going to let this pandemic keep us separated from one another. And I think this has been a testimony to that with these wonderful organizations and wonderful individuals participating. If we didn't get to answer your question, we're saving them so that we can send the answer to you uh, later. We'll get you those answers. And uh, lastly, again, cd13.com for information or contact our office. And I gave you the phone number earlier. Thank you so much, everyone. And uh, we'll see you in a few weeks for my next virtual council member in your corner. Have a good day and be safe.